otters. Perhaps our most beloved mammal. Highly secretive and sparsely distributed, otters are said to be on the increase again. But how many of us will ever see one? In recent years, the press has been full of good news stories. The otter is back. But if you look behind the hype, what is the real picture? There are certainly strongholds in various parts of the country where otters are doing well. Those lucky enough to live by Scotland's quieter locks, for example, will be familiar with otters. There are also small, isolated freshwater populations in the south. But the harsh reality is that much of Britain is still utterly devoid of otters. For centuries, otters were so common, they were considered vermin. They were trapped and shot and hunted for sport. In the late 1950s, the otter population suddenly crashed. Ironically, it was the huntsman who first noticed and brought it to public attention. But it was not hunting which caused this devastation. It was something much more insidious, the introduction of a new generation of pesticides. These highly toxic chemicals found their way into our streams and rivers, and over time decimated much of the wildlife, including otters. The trouble was that otters love to eat eels. And we now know that eels accumulate pesticides more than any other fish. They are effectively living dustbins. And during the 50s and 60s, when these highly toxic pesticides were infiltrating the food chain, eels became a deadly food resource. Otters simply vanished from most of Britain. Because of their devastating impact on wildlife, the offending pesticides were voluntarily withdrawn from use, and gradually water became passably clean once more. Other top predators, which had been badly hit by the pollutants, made a slow and steady recovery. But there was still no sign of otters. The obvious question to ask was, why not? Otters had survived relatively unscathed in the remoter corners of Britain, including the Shetlands. And so Hans Crook, a research biologist, came here to try and solve the mystery. <laughs> 
It's thanks to his work that we now understand the truth about otters. I needed to find out what makes otters tick, why there are more otters in one place than in another. In other words, what limits their number. And to do that, I needed a study area where otters are easy to observe. And right here in Shetland, uh, we've got a population which has always been healthy uh, right through the years, where there are many otters indeed, and where they're active in daytime. The first thing that struck Hans about these otters was how long they spent foraging in the water. One of the main problems which an otter has to solve in its life is how to catch enough fish. And catching fish is extremely difficult for a mammal, even when you are as agile as an otter. Now here in Shetland, otters try to make life a little bit easier for themselves by fishing in daytime. When fish are not active, they're sheltering under the seaweeds and therefore easier to catch. Nevertheless, still only about one in four of an otter's dives is successful. It's really very difficult. It may look effortless and easy, but in fact otters have evolved to hunt in one of the most hostile habitats imaginable. Water is cold and it soon saps an otter's energy reserves. It's a question of getting the balance right between eating enough and surviving the cold. To cope with this hostile environment, otters have some beautiful adaptations, for instance their fur. The outer fur gets soaking wet, but underneath it, you get this thick under fur, you know, which has something like 120,000 hairs per square inch. And that thick under fur is a very good protection against the cold water. But in order to keep the fur in good condition, otters have to spend a tremendous amount of time grooming. And the time and energy involved is very precious. Some people think that there are two species of otter, one living in the sea and one in fresh water. Well, there's only one species of otter in the whole of Britain. But these otters that live in the sea, they also need fresh water every day. Like you can see here in this small freshwater loch, only a couple of hundred yards from the sea in Shetland. And they need the fresh water not for catching food, catching fish. They need the fresh water for washing, to get rid of the salt in their fur because the fur is the only way in which they can protect themselves against this ghastly cold temperature of the water. Otters living on rivers have exactly the same problems as those in Shetland, except, of course, they have constant access to fresh water. But there are other difficulties to contend with. Rivers are no longer a quiet refuge. They're a focus for our leisure time. And because of the persecution otters suffered over the centuries, they avoid people, which these days leaves them little room on the river. At night, the river is quieter. And otters will hunt at night because freshwater fish are easier to catch then. But today, otters are faced with another setback. 
If a river system has very few suitable fish, otters have to travel a long way to get enough to eat. In some areas, otters have to cover a 50 mile river simply to satisfy their basic needs. Because they have to cover such a large area to get enough food, otters inevitably encounter man. Every year, hundreds of otters are killed on the road in Britain, and it's one of the highest causes of their mortality. In Shetland, where it's quiet and there's more food, so an otter's home range is smaller and safer, space is still a problem. Here, Hans has found that otters have social pressures to contend with. There are, I think, about three or four otters living here. And these animals, they compete with each other for food, of course. Uh, and one way in which you notice that is by walking along the coast and you'll find their sand marks, their sprains, as we call them. Now, these sprains, they contain a lot of information. For instance, they tell other otters who is feeding here, whose patch this is. So if I'm an otter, I'm telling you that uh, it's no point feeding here because it's already my patch. Otters often sprint on a rock near the shore just after they've been feeding. And this is an efficient, unaggressive way of sharing an area, as it tells other otters that the place has been fished out and that they shouldn't waste time looking. Even here, food can be hard to find and difficult to handle. In an ideal location, otters have a number of holts throughout their ranges, which are used for resting. In Shetland, holts are typically in peat. <laughs> 
Their rate of reproduction is another limiting factor for otters. They only produce very few young. The cubs are totally helpless and blind when they're born, and it will be two months before they venture outside and see the light of day. Litters are small and often only one or two cubs are born, although there may be as many as four. It depends on the amount of fish the mother can find. This number of cubs is very few compared to, for instance, foxes or badgers. It's a very good indication that there is very little surplus energy around for rearing cubs. Otters don't live very long, on average only about four years, which means that usually a female produces only about two litters in her lifetime, each of about two cubs. At eight weeks old, the cubs emerge from the natal holt for the first time. For a few weeks they're left on shore while their mother goes foraging for the family. Cubs have to learn the difficult art of handling fish on shore before they even attempt to swim and hunt for themselves. They stay with their mother for a year or more in order to learn the necessary skills. This means she can't reproduce every year. Even when weaned, a young otter is still not fully proficient at catching fish. Initially, it may depend on crabs, which are easy to catch, but tricky to cope with. 
crabs provide little nourishment. And so, in the first year away from their mother, even in Shetland, many young otters die. And on rivers, successful breeding is even more difficult. Because of the way we have managed our rivers in the past, there are precious few places left which are secluded enough for breeding holes. But attitudes are changing. Today, there's a great deal of concern for the otter and a corresponding amount of conservation work. A number of people advocate the building of artificial holes. And one of them is Jeff Lyles. A lot of our rivers are devoid of good habitat. I mean, the normal thing that the otters are using in Western Britain in particular are tree root holts, scrubby, dense thickets of vegetation. And if many of those have been taken away through land clearance and uh, river drainage, then rivers may be full of fish, they may have plenty of food, but there's just nowhere for otters to lie up during the day. These artificial holts are absolutely brilliant because they're a way of providing otters with resting sites immediately. Each individual otter needs a number of different resting sites throughout its home range. If a river system has very few suitable sites, then it can support only a few otters, and their chances of breeding successfully will be slim. Another approach is to reintroduce either captive bred or orphaned otters. This otter was found as a small orphaned cub. Its mother had been killed by a car. Now, at a year old, it's ready to be returned to the wild and is taken back to the Isle of Lewis, where it was found. After a few days of acclimatizing to its new surroundings, the otter is set free. Returning an otter to its natural home where conditions are suitable is one thing, but the release of otters which have been bred in captivity is quite another. There are conditions when reintroductions can be useful, but any release of a captive bred otter has to be very carefully planned. It has to happen in exactly the right environment. And for instance, there's no point in releasing an otter in a place where it will be competing with other otters, or in a place which is still polluted. So the key to getting otters back into our rivers is to provide them with ideal conditions in which they can thrive. And in some places, the reintroduction of captive bred otters has been a success. But much of Britain is still unsuitable for otters. With fish stocks low, forcing otters to travel further, encounters with the human world are inevitable. There are now 56 million of us looking to what is left of our countryside for recreation. It's not very surprising that there are so few otters around. Even in Shetland, in the most ideal circumstances, Hans has shown that otters have the odds stacked against them. Because they hunt in cold water, their energy expenditure is high, and therefore food consumption must also be high. 
there is little spare energy around for rearing heavily dependent cubs. An otter's life is short and hard. It's a way of life that works, but only just. Against all these odds, it's in fact remarkable that otters still exist at all. They're walking a tightrope between low reproduction and high mortality. And it doesn't need much of an extra cause of death to spell the end of these lovely animals. But as long as we look after their environment, their natural habitat, as long as we make sure that fish are doing well, chances are that someday they'll be back again all over Britain. And that will be a time worth seeing. Next week's Wildlife on One may appear to be in black and white, but do not adjust your sense. We're looking closely at one of nature's design masterpieces, the zebra. While the secret of their stripes intrigues us, their affectionate family relationships will charm us. Africa's exotic striped horses are also the trailblazers for what has become known as the greatest wildlife spectacle on Earth. For further information on otters, please send a stamp-addressed envelope to P.O. Box 7, London W12, 8UD.